Superstore is an American television series created and produced by Justin Spitzer, who, among other things, was this guy from the fun run episode of The Office. So, uh, so that is where her uterus went. Now, I have some thoughts about Spitzer's writing approach, and we're going to get into that later in this video. Superstore stars America Ferreira and Ben Feldman, who both serve as executive producers on the show, alongside a diverse cast of actors. Superstore follows the staff of a fictional discount megastore set here in my hometown of St. Louis, Missouri. The series ran from November 2015 to March 2021 and had six seasons, of which I have only seen the first. That may seem like a list of random factoids about the series, but all of it's going to come up later in this video. This is going to be a departure from the normal stuff I put out here on YouTube, in which I have a deep familiarity with the source content, its fandom, and its memes. Also, rather than reviewing every episode like I do for The Office, as the title suggests, I'm going to break down and analyze an entire season. So I'd love to incorporate your feedback as I go. Feel free to leave comments about the style and approach I take in the comments below. For this video, I'll break down the story of season one of Superstore, talk about the deeper meaning, and then I'll finish with a summarization of the season along with my thoughts on maybe where the story is headed. Also, from my understanding, this first season of Superstore, like most series, suffers from a lower critical rating and fan sentiment than the rest of the series. So I'll be keeping that in mind as I go. I also feel like I should mention that while I've worked a variety of jobs so far in my life, I have never worked retail, meaning that I can't bring any of my experience into the analysis like I can for a lot of the you know, more office and corporate content that I cover on this channel. So some of the jokes and bits might interrupt my suspension of disbelief due to the wild things happening on screen that I have no context for. I mean, I've been to Walmart and Target. Like when I was a kid living in the sticks, we would drive 30, 40 minutes just to get to the nearest Walmart. And I'd spend hours there perusing all of the aisles that would be socially acceptable, but mostly spent my time in the electronics department. These trips were an event. Later in life, when my wife and I were dating and we had no money, we would often, as a cheap date, just go walk around Target talking about all the things we saw on the shelves that rich people took for granted. Superstores like Walmart and Target, but more than that, like Kmart and Venture, took suburbs across America by storm. These companies could buy cheap in bulk. Because they had shelf and storage space for pallets of unused product, they could sit and wait for their time to shine on the shelf. They could also shift inventory across stores depending on the demand through the network of different locations. This new business model gave consumers the incentive to shop there because of their lower prices and the convenience that they offered, but also as a byproduct they often ran small businesses out of business. No one was safe from this model. General stores, hardware stores, grocers, electronics, almost everything needed to sustain an American lifestyle day to day could be purchased in a discount superstore. And while I don't think this shift in capitalistic approach solely changed the American culture, it definitely made its mark. With the shift to internet shopping, many of these superstores had to differentiate their business and adapt to ever changing modern sensibilities. I was born in the mid 80s and ever since I I can remember, superstores have existed and have evolved with the times, otherwise they went out of business. I never knew a world without them, so I thought it was really interesting that a primetime television series was going to center in on one of these for a workplace ensemble comedy. A comedy that I have to admit is pretty formulaic. They stood on the shoulders of geniuses and as a result, it doesn't break much of the mold set before it. But I'm not sure they needed to do that, or were even able to. The structure for each episode of Superstore follows the standard three-act structure with a cold opening and an end stinger. The first act is used for setup, the second is used to build tension, and the third brings that tension to a climax and resolves the story. Commercial breaks are typically the designated transition point for each act, and to ease us back in from that commercial break, often a random bid is employed from around the store focusing on some seemingly random occurrence involving a customer, in displays, or or some other retail related conceptual chaos. These more often than not fell flat for me and amounted to a lot of wasted time, but there were a few notable outliers. Now, these injections did feel stronger as the season went on, so maybe they perfected it moving forward. Personally, I wasn't a fan of how they work in a streaming era as they interrupted the pace of the story and I personally am not coming back from a commercial break. I was just watching the previous scene fade to black and then now random nonsense is happening. Now, I'm aware it's completely unfair to criticize a show because I'm watching it on a different medium. That medium, streaming, is how I watch the series and it's the only way to watch it now. And also, it, it, it existed in 2016, so 
It's not all bad, though. It's not a bad thing that the show was formulaic, and I was genuinely surprised from time to time. And I thought the deeper meaning across the season was pretty well done. But enough about the series. Let's dive into it. You work here? Since when? Uh, since right now. I'm, I'm, it's actually my, my first day. Superstore Episode 1 introduces us to our two main characters, with a brand new hire, Jonah, and the floor supervisor, Amy, as they start their workday at Cloud 9, which, based on the color scheme, is intended to give us Walmart vibes. Jonah is a silver-tongued fella that is bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, while he seems to maintain this humble attitude, his overall vibe, comprised of his vocab, physical appearance, and mental prowess all beg the characters and us alike to question, why is he working here? I know, <laughs> I don't seem like the kind of person who would work in a place like this. Amy, on the other hand, is a hardworking, relatively no-nonsense manager who just wants to get her job done and keep the calamity at a minimum and get off work. Honestly, at first take, Amy seems like the kind of person who could be doing better than working at Cloud9 but is perhaps trapped by her own inhibitions or by some other circumstances like a tough financial situation, which makes a job change impractical or even impossible. And I just heard what I said. I know how that sounds as I'm writing this. I have to deal with this pretty early on. I personally don't think that anyone is above or below working retail, right? But we're any job, blue collar, white collar, food service, nonprofit, whatever jobs. Because I am collar blind. For the most part, I think our upbringing, financial situation, our ambitions, attitude, acumen, all of that stuff combines to create what career we'll find ourselves in. And I thought the series did a pretty good job of exploring this concept throughout its first season. Having said that, these jobs are generally considered unskilled and as such, they pay very low. Free to move about the capitalistic landscape of America, the series has to deal with why these people are working a dead-end job with little to no benefits and way too much crap to deal with from corporate and customers alike. But let's take a moment to look at those people. To round out the cast, we meet an overtly religious manager, Glenn, who seems to fit the idiot with a heart of gold trope. Also, he's played by Mark McKinney, who I instantly recognized from Kids in the Hall. We're also introduced to an actual no-nonsense assistant to the manager and Dina, who seems to be written very similar to Dwight. So similar, I'm sure I'm not the first person who's made that comparison. Also, she's crushing on Jonah. Then we meet another new hire, Mateo, who's what we would call in the 90s a butt kisser. Not because he's gay, but because he's a suck up. So I'm kind of actually rooting for you to fail. Okay, thanks, bye. Also, he's gay. Not that there's anything wrong with that. We're also introduced to the age-old sitcom of the cool black guy best friend in a wheelchair named Garrett. Also, I can't figure out what his job is. Then we meet Cheyenne, the pregnant 17-year-old, and Bo, her fiancé. And he's played by the guy who got Ant-Man in trouble in Baskin Robbins. Also, he's older than me, which I thought was weird. Lastly, along with a plethora of one-off and background characters, the store itself seems to somewhat be a character in this world store is personified by corporate, but also comes to life in its set design. Now, I didn't research much for this video. I wanted to give as much of my raw perspective as I could. Now, I really like this set, mainly because it doesn't feel like a set. I wouldn't be surprised if they built an entire inside of a store here, but I'm not 100% on that. Typically, television series using just one primary location have a challenge of creating a lay of the land in the audience's mind, and that's not so much an issue for Superstore, which I can think of two reasons for. For one, and I could be wrong, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was a soundstage dedicated solely to the interior shots of the show. The exterior shots were probably set on location and an old storefront repurposed by the studio, but probably was something similar to Cloud9 in its previous life. But these inside shots scream soundstage. The audio capture is fantastic. The lighting is incredible. Everything feels right. The other reason the geography doesn't present much challenge is that we all probably have spent a significant amount of time in a store like this. So we're familiar with the different areas. They're all so similar differing only in very minor things and branding. Less work then needs to be done to establish where these characters are because it already makes sense. This is checkout. This is the jewelry department. This is the electronics and so on. It just works. Everything feels lived in. It feels established albeit maybe a little cleaner than we'd really expect, but I could say the same is true for most targets I've been in in the last several years. It's a branding thing, and I should mention that Cloud9's branding throughout the store is on point. 
really enjoyed spotting out a lot of the random small details embedded on the walls and shelves. So like every pilot ever, this episode serves to introduce us to these characters and set up the world that we're going to be living in. Jonah talks a big game, but makes a point that he wants to enjoy life. While he doesn't quite reach Sean Spencer levels of goofing off, he does manage to knock over one of those displays that only really seem to exist in stores put to film. He also ends up repricing a ton of merch to a comically lower price. And this is how we know we're living in a Spitzer comedy. I'm pretty sure you start most of these employees off spoon feeding them the basics and working with them in some sort of trainer buddy situation. Probably not out there using the electronic pricing system on his first day. But the real reason we know we're in a Spitzer comedy is that while Jonah is consistently ruining Amy's day with his shenanigans, he makes it up to her with a lovely display of glowing stars on the ceiling, which he probably wasted the rest of his day doing, and it would be impossible for her to not notice that he was getting a ladder and sticking stars up on the roof. <laughs> and it would have been impossible for her to not notice, but none of that matters because it makes for a cool moment. A working thesis of Spitzer's writing method is just to imagine the spectacle, be it cringe or heartwarming moment, and then work backwards from that. With the story beats flowing and making sense, taking a back seat to advancing to that big magical moment on screen, something we're gonna see a lot during this season. Now, Amy and Jonah seem to be the heart of the show right off the bat. They are the Jim and Pam of Superstore. At first, I thought every plot hurdle in the series from here on out will support their will they won't they. Which I'll remind you I've only watched season one, seems like that could still be a possibility, but it's equally possible that these characters are just archetypes meant to reinforce some deeper meaning Spitzer has in mind for the series. For example, I originally read Amy revealing her wedding band as she walked to her car, a very layered reveal to the will they won't they. I'm asking myself, oh. Is she still married? Is she having marital problems? Maybe she just likes to keep her lives separate. Maybe she slipped it off earlier when she saw that new hottie associate. But after watching the rest of the season play out, I think this moment was actually less intended to serve the will they won't they and more to establish the parallels that we're going to see between Cheyenne and Amy. But heck, maybe it's both. I don't really know. Because Stratus is doing a profile on our store. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. From there, the first several episodes of the season work further to establish the main characters and the universe of the series while setting the groundwork for the main plot lines of the season. Like in the magazine profile, the store has been selected to be featured in an internal communications platform which takes the form of an intra-company magazine. Internal communications is something that is very near and dear to me as it is related to my actual day job. As such, I'm vastly aware that internal communications can have a pretty poor reputation for resulting in a lot of overhead for a company, and an intra-company magazine like this would surely cost a lot of money to produce, and yet like maybe three people in the store of dozens and dozens and dozens of employees might actually read it. But for the second episode of the series, it makes for a fascinating premise because it establishes one of the main undercurrents of the season. The employees believe themselves, and probably are, underpaid. And rumor has it that a great profile in the Cloud9 magazine could result in higher wages as a reward for their example to other stores. The communication specialist slash journalist coming to research for the piece reacts to the various personalities around the store, but she's mainly interested in Jonah. And it's revealed that she doesn't quite take her job that seriously either, juxtaposed to Dina who takes her job very seriously. The chaos of all the performances done by the employees for the journalist is all undercut in a very office way when the writer reveals that she just needs a couple quotes and a picture for the magazine, that the stories are basically pre-written fluff pieces. The B-plot of the episode is seemingly inconsequential and gives Cheyenne and her new fiance, an aspiring artist, something to do by attempting to create a new company jingle. I'm not sure if this bit really goes anywhere in the future, but I feel like a 17-year-old low-level associate employee and her significantly older fiancé in the suburbs of St. Louis attempting to create an unsolicited jingle for what I'm assuming is a mega corporation is kind of bonkers and unrealistic. This again might be intentional though, it might be juxtaposing the naive ideals and aspirations of the common worker against the cold corporate juggernaut and the calloused workers who've been under their thumb for long enough. Whatever, Illuminati. Are we cloud nine? Yeah! 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 The customer's always right. Oh, yeah. They're not wrong. 
Shots and Salsa, the third episode of the series, serves to tackle the taboo topic of racism, which acts as a very cleansed version of The Office's Diversity Day. Rather than Michael Scott creating a racial controversy and then stepping in to white knight the situation, Glenn in this case asks Amy and Mateo to work the salsa sample booth. Which even I know that's not how these sample booths work, but Amy refuses out of principle and then has to deal with the repercussions of taking a stand for what she thinks is right, which is another one of the undercurrents running throughout the season, creating this thematic idea of taking a stand for what someone thinks is right in spite of the consequences. We see this in the B plot in which the pharmacy isn't properly staffed and Jonah decides to throw his hat in to help dish out flu shots once again with no training whatsoever, and this goes about as well as you think a setup in a sitcom involving discount store shoppers waiting in long lines for an understaffed pharmacy would go. Shots and Salsa serves as commentary on the dangers of involving or uninvolving yourself with the truest of intentions. The episode has this internal synergy, but it doesn't do much to advance the plot of the season though invoking racism and the thematic ideas in a casual and humorous way will surely lend to the deeper meaning. Oh. Problem solved. Are you kidding me? This is not a sexual thing. Amy, you've got a good butt. Up next is Mannequin, in which every employee becomes obsessed with a mannequin that has a decent likeness to Jonah. Now, Jonah's kind of weirded out by it, and this whole bit somewhat treads on a Seinfeld joke and the bailer from The Office. It's clear through the events of this episode that Jonah is a good-hearted person who genuinely seems to want to relate to his co-workers he wants to fit amongst them. Amy's delegated some of her responsibilities over to Mateo because she's busy messing with Jonah. This propels the will-they-won't-they they feel between Jonah and Amy, but more on that in a minute. The B-plot follows Glenn and Dina vying for the opportunity to adopt Cheyenne's baby, which serves to build out these characters just a little bit more. Glenn turns out to be a kind-hearted fella who seems, and this might be going out on a limb, somewhat trapped by his beliefs and worldview. He seems to stick to this prototypical American Protestant Christian ideology, but he does have a soft side and seems to care about people. We're going to see more of this dichotomy of character from Glenn going forward. Dina, on the other hand, doubles down on being the Dwight of the show. Amongst the baby talk, we also learn that Amy has a daughter, and Amy's motherhood is another element of her character, but also serves as a connection point again between Amy and Cheyenne. There is so much I don't understand about sales. In Shoplifter, the fifth episode of the series, we're getting more comfortable with these characters and the actors seem to be finding their groove. And this one's all about breaking the rules in order to help someone out. Again, noting that theme. Amy, against corporate policy, brings her daughter to work as she had no other choice. It actually works because most of the stores are giants and, you know, there's plenty of places to hide. Jonah helps Amy in hiding her daughter and even filling some interesting shoes for her while she's busy. What do you know about periods? Amy's busy because the A plot and the B plot collide when Dina is certain that a customer has attempted to steal something from Cloud9. Dina pulls Amy in to interrogate the woman, and we arguably get the most funny joke of the series up to this point. So how exactly are we getting her to confess? We're going classic good cop, bad cop. Hey there, this is my bestie, Amy. Be careful of her, she's a little unstable. <clears throat> Dirt bag. Ow. It works because of the subversion of expectations, and I just thought it was a well-timed and delightful joke, which reminded me that I hadn't laughed much up to this point. Just an occasional, huh, or maybe a, oh, I see what you did there. I'm not an overly laugh out loud type of person, so take this for what it's worth, but based on the IMDb scores for this season, I don't think I'm an outlier in saying that this one isn't gut bustingly funny. It does feel smart enough though. Nevertheless, the tension in Shoplifter is masterful. As evidence mounts against Dina's case, it seems like her job might actually be on the line. That is until Glenn goes full on corrupt and frames the accused shoplifter just to save Dina's job. It's a solid moment of heart between these characters who I don't think could be more different. Now there is a C-plot in Shoplifter in which Cheyenne and Mateo duke it out over who will get a fancy couch, which is further discounted because someone breathed their last on it last week. 
I debated including that in this review because it didn't really impact the episode very much, except to breathe more life into this relationship matrix as it plays out. But it does go a long way to establish that these workers are willing to accept a piece of furniture that they know that someone has died on the week before, perhaps reinforcing the financial situations of these folks. Like, where does a person's belief in the supernatural meet their frugality? And it begged the question of which I asked several coworkers, would you buy a couch that was heavily discounted if you knew that someone had died on it the week before, assuming no bodily fluids were involved? Wow, could be in a Lifetime movie. <laughs> Thanks. They are wickedly sour. Moving on, Secret Shopper is an episode that gives us Sean Gunn. This episode centers around the concept of fear as a witch hunt ensues for a secret shopper that corporate may or may not be sending to the Cloud9 branch. Secret Shoppers, if you're not familiar, is when a company wants to experience and document how a retail location treats its guests and each other, they'll send a secret shopper, someone incognito who will observe and report on all these things. The idea of someone secretly spying, working against them, caused the staff to begin to act with paranoia. Glenn and Mateo become convinced that the secret shopper might be a secret employee, a plant placed by corporate to spy on management down through the associates. People begin to get suspicious over Jonah as he's new to the area, his car is way too nice for associates to afford, and he just aced his corporate policies exam. Which like, is that a thing? I mean, I assume everyone has to sit through these stupid web trainings no matter what your job is, but is there like an SATs for working at Walmart? Leave it in the comments. Either way, Jonah acing that test creates fiction between he and Amy until she reveals that she's just afraid of Jonah's success overshadowing her, and Jonah reveals that he came to Cloud9 after dropping out of business school. The episode concludes with a fantastic joke, with Jonah accidentally causing havoc, and then the crew watching the Secret Shopper footage later, with Glenn remarking that, Dill scored pretty well compared to Richmond Heights. Turns out they had a meth lab in their basement, which turns out was just a front for a dog fighting ring. And I guess at the end of the day, the Secret Shopper was just the friends that we made along the way. You know they just sent the same guy they did last time, right? You were about to experience Cloud9 as you have never experienced it before. Color Wars is a great episode with a weird premise. The contest for employees is revealed, which splits the staff into a red team and a yellow team. This seems like standard fare for corporate googly gop, even basing a joke in a pizza parties aren't good motivators for adults bit. But there is one glaringly obvious problem with this contest. It makes no sense to me at all. The points are based on sales. And while I've never worked at a discount superstore, I have been to one before. It's like pulling teeth to get someone to help me. And honestly, rightfully so. Selling stuff is not their job. I mean, in all of my years going to Walmart and Target, there's only been like a handful of times that a person working electronics even knew the answer to the question that I might have. Hi there. Is there a project you're working on? I know more than you. All right. So none of this makes sense because the red shirts could try really hard, get hands on with the customer to generate those sales. And then the customer just go to a yellow shirt for checkout. And those points would go to the yellow shirt. This is an address. So I'm assuming we're either supposed to accept it at face value or it's a layered joke about the ineptitude of management. When the day begins, most of the associates are blowing off the contest anyway. But after Amy learns that there's a $100 prize for the employees on the winning team, the contest kicks it up a notch. The episode takes a very Seinfeldian turn. Even with $100 on the line, Jonah cringes at the idea of upselling products to people who don't need them, which at best is a waste of money or at worst digging them further into debt over things that they don't need. Amy sharing a team with Jonah implores him to upsell because even though Jonah doesn't need the money, she does. In which it's revealed here or earlier in the season, I'm blanking now, that Amy is putting herself through school. While the chaos of the contest is in full swing, Jonah decides to upsell, and he does a lot because he's good at everything, but especially with one particular customer, who's an aspiring barbecue grill YouTuber. As someone who's had to be very careful in how I spend my money to grow this channel, I felt a lot during this sequence just to feel so much more when we learn that the fella that Jonas sold all of these unnecessary goods to 
happens to be Amy's husband, who is steadfast that he needs to pursue his dreams, and the couple argue, insinuating that things aren't going very well in their marriage. Meanwhile, Dina is sad about the death of her pet bird, which might only exist to foreshadow the death of Amy's marriage. Time will tell. I don't know if they stay together or not. I really appreciated the tension and the reveal of this dude being Amy's husband. It worked really well. I checked the IMDb scores and it is the highest rated episode for the series so far. So I'm glad I see eye to eye on that. You hired him. That's why if it was up to me, I'd fire half the staff. No, don't put that on the cake. Now, I swear to God, one of these days I'm going to strangle you. I'd like to see you try. Is that a threat? You threaten me. Moving on with wedding sale, Cloud9 is holding their annual wedding day sale. This episode is kind of a calamity. On one hand, I was 20 years old and dirt poor when I was getting married, so I'm so glad that stores like Cloud9 existed for me. We were able to get enough to constitute a wedding, and it was dirt cheap, comparatively speaking. So the concept of an annual wedding day sale is neat, and after everything we've learned about Amy's marriage, it gives her another opportunity to bring her personal life into work, something that she was vehemently opposed to it when we first met her. She does so by venting, or better said, by projecting onto Cheyenne. That being this young, struggling to make it as a couple, let alone a family of three, is going to be a difficult and uphill battle, which causes Cheyenne's boo thing to just peace out. Dina and Amy go on a journey to track him down, Amy to make things right because she's the one that put her foot in her mouth in the first place, and Dina to get the price scanner Bo was holding when the couple were filling out the registry. Glenn in the meantime tries to exhibit his tolerance by letting Mateo set up a same-sex wedding day aisle. Meanwhile, Garrett and Jonah attempt to help Cheyenne finish the couple's registry in Bo's absence. Dina and Amy get a little closer after Dina shows a little vulnerability about being depressed during the wedding sale and admitting that she has a special secret boo thing crush of her own. They find Bo, everything ends well. Maybe they'll surprise us. Then let's bleed some green. Yeah, come and get to take a little shower in this stuff. Or not. With three episodes left in the season, we get a really interesting one, an all-nighter. The Cloud9 team must work late, and they accidentally get locked into the store because all of those things are controlled electronically. Now, it seems that in a store like this, there would be like a night crew, but not in the superstore world. But it does use the trope of breaking the average mundane workday to see these characters exist in a different situation and help everyone get out of their shell. Like Cheyenne confesses that she wishes she would have gotten pregnant during a different time time in life as she wanted to pursue her love for dance. Gara mentions the Cloud9 music's turned off. Kind of like the music. It makes me feel like I'm on hold all day. To which Garrett presses and says that Glenn's a corporate yes man and he likes everything there is to like about Cloud9. Glenn has a very strong reaction to this. Later some alcohol is damaged and the group starts to drink. The spirits liven up the group who all decide to play Never Have I Ever. Dina decides to play asking a very personal question. Never have I ever hooked up in the store. But she finds out she's the outlier. Staff declaring that the photography department's dark room is their hookup zone, Dina hatches a plan to seduce Jonah. While Mateo's spiffing up Dina, Cheyenne gives a performance, beginning with an elegant ballet-type dance, and morphing it into a hip-hop dance thereafter. Meanwhile, Dina comes on to Jonah, who's too nice to decline in a straightforward manner, and attempts to de-escalate by saying that it's inappropriate because she's his boss. Afterwards, a drunk Amy, seemingly moved by Cheyenne and her story, confesses that she was accepted into a good college, but she got pregnant and had to enter the workforce to support her family, which reveals why she feels so strongly about Cheyenne's situation. Lynn reveals that Cloud9 is responsible for his father's hardware store being put out of business by Cloud9 coming to town. And it's nice to see under the surface of Glenn, who to this point has had sparks of humanity, but generally speaking was just kind of used as a clown. He later attempts to leave some mean-spirited voicemails to corporate, but he relents before he commits. Dina finds out that associates dating a superior is not forbidden and attempts to win over Jonah once again. Jonah
Fiona turns her down again because he says he still doesn't feel right because she's his boss. Leading to the next episode, Demotion. The shocking reveal here is that Dina steps down and hopes that Jonah will be interested in dating her. Amy's offered Dina's job as assistant manager, but is hesitant because she says it's the same amount of work for less money. Amy tries to help Glenn find a replacement. This includes Discount Andy from American Auto and a few other characters that we've seen on the show on and off. Jonah's finally honest with Dina in the most awkward way possible. Dina, I'm so sorry, but I don't have the same feelings for you that you oh, do for me. sorry. I, uh... Dina seems to be getting along just fine, going on a date soon thereafter, and Amy finally takes the job after seeing Glenn try to do both. Again, working to the theme of helping each other out. A lot is happening in this episode, and you could tell it's boiling up to something, but it did feel jumbled and broke the pace of the series so far. For the season finale, Labor has the that's so Spitzer effect. This is the season finale, so many of the plot lines are culminating. Cheyenne is beginning her contractions, but refuses to quit working. Having just watched the episode of The Office in which the same thing happens, I thought this would be a retread on the parental fear one feels before a baby is born. But instead, it's revealed that she's trying to keep trucking on because she needs the money. After the baby's born, she's going to be off for a bit recovering and connecting to the little one. This sheds the light on what the season's undercurrent has slowly been flowing towards. Benefits like paid time off in the US at least are typically not found in hourly retail jobs, meaning that workers like Cheyenne are forced to plan accordingly in order to take time off, unpaid, and no real guarantee that her job is still 100% waiting for her when she's able to return to work. This forces working parents to make tough choices between physically healing their bodies and simultaneously bonding with their spawn with going back to work to make some umpteen dollars an hour to survive. The staff have a discussion about what they can do and Jonah suggests that they call corporate, inquiring if paid maternity leave is on the table for Cheyenne. The employee services hotline shoots this down quickly, but Jonah mentions unions, which warrants a direct response from Cloud9, who sends a labor relations consultant to help sort out any questions or concerns the associates may have. But all of the talking points the consultant has are slanted towards unions are bad. Now a little bit about my channel, I try to keep it free from politics, but I go where the content is taking me. In this case, Superstore has a message about unions, so we're going to have to talk about that. The series is picking up real life practices that companies like Cloud9 have used over the years, even training employees on how to handle fellow employees who attempt to organize the workforce. Now, John Oliver did a fantastic piece about union busting practices back in 2021, which focused on companies like Amazon. Go check out that video if you're interested. But that's the beast we're dealing with in this episode. Simply spoken, companies don't like a unionized workforce because it's more expensive, creates walls and ceilings for laborers, and it also gives the power of the workforce to negotiate new and improved benefits. People in unions love these benefits. They're the flip side of the corporation's negatives. They're generally paid better, work is controlled, safety is enforced, and they're able to collectively throw their weight around to garner more comprehensive benefits. Benefits like paid maternity leave. Now Buster here explains that they don't need a union because Cloud9 gives them everything that they need, but doesn't mention their original concern for Cheyenne. Meanwhile, it's clear that Dina might not be happy that she stepped down, and with Cheyenne finally giving birth to her baby girl named Harmonica, which is poetic in the sense that the main thematic element that we'll explore for the deeper meaning is the idea of harmony. All of this moves Glenn for his employees, and he decides to give Cheyenne paid maternity leave even after Buster refused. Buster hears this and shockingly fires Glenn. This leads to a season ending moment in which all of the workers walk out in solidarity, all except Dina, who's glad to capitalize on this opportunity. This is a big moment, but rest assured, Cloud9 will be fine without you. It's a big spectacle. The emotional highs and lows of this ending is Prime Spitzer who attempts to unify this seemingly diverse and unique group of retail associates together. It's his thing. So let's pull all of this together in the deeper meaning. What does a bean mean? Someone please explain it to Kat. Admittedly, this is the first time I've attempted to analyze an entire season's worth of TV and derive a single message from it. Across all of the arcs, and we have a lot, like the mystery of Jonah's background, 
and as will they won't they with Amy, a character whose background is slowly unraveled throughout the season, with the character keeping her personal and professional life so separate that she doesn't even wear her wedding ring in the store for reasons that I don't 100% understand yet, but I read it much more as a way to keep those worlds separate. Throughout the series though, Jonah's influence on her seems to dispel that, and by the end, her walls are down. Other arcs like assistant manager Dina's intensity and intense feelings for Jonah, young Cheyenne's pregnancy, Glenn's attempt to balance his love-hate relationship with Cloud9, and there's also a subplot with his religious foundation coinciding with the diversity of the workplace. And that diversity is interesting. We have people fitting every demographic that a show in 2016 would likely take on. We have black, white, Latina, Asian, and then a cross-section of different demographics like educated, uneducated, young, old, disabled, and homosexual. Considering the racially diverse cast of characters, it seems that setting this show in the St. Louis area was a deliberate statement. The area made the news not but two years prior to the pilot of this series with the police killing of an unarmed black man. St. Louis has always had a complicated relationship with racial tensions, and using St. Louis as a backdrop of the story about a diverse group of characters is welcomed for me. I'm excited to see where the show decides to take these stories, but the arc for season one's message seems to be clear that for all of the mess and entanglement, which is intrinsically linked into helping one another out, it's always worth it. Whether it's putting up with people who annoy you, people who are going to treat you poorly no matter what, or having to humble yourself by overcoming biases, be they racial, status, orientation, or whatnot. It's a reminder that all of these people are just people. They're humans who choose day over day to report to a job just to make a livable wage. Like most of our coworkers, we only get a glimpse of what their private life is like. The rest is up to our imagination. Dina's a bird owner, and based on that fact alone, she's obviously a serial killer. But the question that was nagging me throughout the season is, why are these people choosing to be here? Why work a retail job? And the show challenged my way of thinking. Superstore isn't glorifying working a retail job, exhibited by most of these commercial injections that I didn't really like, but reinforced by the corporate culture and almost every joke presented in the series. But it does explain why people end up in these jobs and why people stay here. Amy sees herself in Cheyenne. She's working at Cloud9 because it's a job where she can work enough to get by and manage her life. The problem is, as life goes on, we can find ourselves in situations in which we're stuck under a ceiling of circumstances that are a combination of our own doing, our own poor choices, coupled with corporate greed. And I hope we heard both of those things. Because through our life choices, we can find ourselves stuck in a job. The longer we stay there, the more expensive things get, like gas, rent, and groceries go up, but our wages don't always follow a parallel chart, causing us to work overtime just to make ends meet. Meaning that time to potentially improve prove ourselves to upskill in order to move into a different career path become increasingly more rare. And when it is available, people have worked themselves into exhaustion just to keep the lights on. And it's easy to throw shade at someone like Cheyenne and Amy and say, well, you had other opportunities other paths around the ceiling and so on. But you know, like literally everything in life is nuanced. Some people aren't ambitious and they're very happy just to survive. Some people get blinded by everyday chaos of life and they can't envision a better world for themselves and for their family. Some people weren't privileged to have parents, teachers, and older folks around them to show them how to win at the game of life and they're just figuring it out on their own. And some people just want to work retail jobs. There's nothing wrong with any of that. I don't know if Jonah and Amy are going to have a romance or not, but the show juxtaposes them so well. Jonah's coming from privilege, where the world is opened for him. It's his oyster. And he's like, nah. Amy's grasping and clawing at every opportunity, putting herself through school, working full time, being married to a knuckle dragger who's just discovered fire, and trying to raise her progeny. Different worlds working at the same place. It's neat. It's human, and we see what the show is doing by looking at them. From Jonah to Amy, and everyone in between throughout the events of the season, they decide to interlock their arms in order to support the ones who might get left behind. Putting their own sustenance on the line, counting on one another in hopes that the company has heart. Which it does not. And this was evident through the series so far. Whether a company like Cloud9 should have a heart or not, whether they should perform union busting tactics or not, and whether or not they should offer benefits to their employees is a different discussion altogether. Instead, I think the idea of the union being invoked in this series is just reinforcing that 
concept of a unified group of people who will do whatever it takes to protect their weakest from a society who will just move on without them. No matter what their race is, no matter what their creed is, no matter whether they agree with their politics, no matter what. Because life is full of people who are looking out for themselves. But when you find that group of people who can be your ride or die, who will put everything out on the line for you to exhibit unity in a way that's not normal, that's pretty cool. And it makes for a classic Spitzer moment. What was that moment earned? I'll admit, I tried to watch this series several times since it initially aired years ago. I'd see promos on YouTube ads and the Super Bowl or something, and I just never was interested in it. The show was recommended to me several times by coworkers and friends over the last several years. It was recommended several times since I started this YouTube channel in the comments. I just really didn't care to give it a chance. Knowing that season one is rated lower than the rest does give me some hope. I wasn't quite enthralled into the story of Superstore. The characters felt like caricatures, and I think I was supposed to care a lot more why a guy like Jonah was working at a Superstore. Like, it was some mystery of grave concern. And honestly, all of that flew right over my head. I just assumed that in this world, attractive, funny, smart, quirky people just worked at Walmart. I just thought that Jonah's whatever Spitzer wanted him to be. A few episodes in, it really wasn't lost on me anymore. I saw what they were doing with his character. I still wouldn't say I cared much. The reveal that he dropped out of school gave me a lot of questions, but questions I didn't really need the answers to. I am much more intrigued with the Amy story, as her character does seem pretty real and relatively stuck. I appreciated many of the other characters, though they didn't take any of them very deep, except maybe Cheyenne. But in fairness, Cheyenne is used more as a mascot, which the writers would use to rally the characters who had agency around rather than just, you know, a well-rounded human being. Now, if you followed Spitzer's career, then you know what I'm about to say. Sometimes these big, spectacled, emotional episodes are unearned. I noticed this in some of his writing in The Office as well. Spitzer seems to like to start in the end zone. He sees a group of Walmart employees stand arm in arm walking out in solidarity in defense of not only their manager who's been fired, but organized to the benefit of one of their coworkers who's struggling. Then he works backwards. How do we get from Z to A? And the problem is, I think he gets lost in the weeds. Or NBC likes to meddle with his creations. Some of these things like the walkout, it could have been more teased. It could have been more set up. Also, the way the staff rallies around Glenn, it felt unearned as not many, if any, really shared much depth with him. I think the deepest we got is the best episode of the season in All Nighter. This is undeniably a great moment. I loved it. It just felt unearned. American Auto Season 1 suffered from the exact same issues. As it is though, it's not a bad American television comedy. After watching it and writing this video, I would recommend anyone who likes shows in the Scherniverse to give this one a shot. But know that it's wading through shallow water before ever getting anything deep enough to generate some rapids. And that concludes my thoughts on season one of Superstore. I'm very excited to see where they take these ideas and characters that they've brought to life. If you want to go on this journey with me, do all the youtube -y stuff. And as someone who doesn't have much context on Superstore beyond what I've already watched, I'd love to hear your thoughts on season one. And I'd also love to hear any comments on any of these takes that I had about the season. And also, as always, if you want to recommend another workplace or office type series to take a look at, leave it in the comments. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time.